Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, the NumPy stack in Python. In this lecture, we are going to talk about feature vectors. First, I want you to consider what is a vector. A very basic definition is that it's simply a list of numbers. At this point, I think we know what a list is, and I think we know what numbers are, so there's no need to break this down further. But importantly, we can visualize vectors by drawing them on the Cartesian plane. This is going to be useful for conceptualizing what machine learning does in the abstract sense. So now that we know what a vector is, what is a feature vector? Well, we've looked at many examples of this in the last few lectures. One of my favorite examples is predicting someone's exam grade. To do this, we have a table of inputs. Remember, this is an n by d matrix where n is the number of samples and d is the number of features. For example, we have d equals 3 here, and the input features are how many hours you studied for the exam, how many hours you spent playing video games during the exam period, and how many classes you missed this semester. What I want you to notice is that each row of this table is a different feature vector. What's super important to understand about this is that no matter what data set we looked at, our data always looked like this. X was always a 2D matrix of shape n by d. Doesn't matter what the features are or what data set they came from. So for this particular example, student number one's feature vector is 10, 3, 0. Each individual element we call a feature. So for example, how many hours you studied is a feature. So why is this important? Well, for a feature to be useful, it has to be predictive. That means it must help us predict the output variable. Intuitively, we know that your exam grade probably depends on how much you studied. But obviously, if I tried to predict your grade on the exam based on how tall you are, I probably wouldn't get very far. Your height is probably not a useful feature for this problem. So a lot of people ask me, in the real world, how can I come up with good features? And there are a variety of approaches you can take. One is not necessarily better than the other. But it's good to know what approaches are available to you so you know what to try when you're working on your own machine learning project. The first one is very simple and what most people would consider obvious, using your domain knowledge. For example, an expert in, say, anatomy is going to come up with better features for a biological data set than, say, an accountant. I'm assuming accountants don't know that much about biology, but I could be wrong. In any case, let's assume this is true. Now, on the other hand, an accountant can probably come up with better features for a financial data set than a biologist can. This is because each person is an expert in their respective fields. And we are all experts in going to school and taking exams, so we know that a person's height doesn't really affect how well you do on the exam, whereas how much you studied does. Another approach you can take is purely mathematical and requires no domain knowledge at all. One example of this is a polynomial expansion. We know that if we have a complex curve, we can use an infinite Taylor series to approximate this curve. Normally, we don't need an infinite number of terms, but just enough so that it represents the pattern. So for example, if our original measurement is x, then we can make x squared a feature, x cubed a feature, and so on. So how would this work? Well, suppose we try to fit y equals ax plus b, which is a line, but we find that it isn't a good model because we get a large error. Then we could just add more terms, for example, this degree 4 polynomial that you see here. Now it's important to realize that in some sense, this method is more powerful because it doesn't require you to understand anything about the data you're working with. In fact, that seems really powerful. Studying biology and finance probably takes a really long time. So a biologist could work on a finance data set and an accountant could work on a biology data set using this technique. But that doesn't mean that a biologist wouldn't come up with more useful features on the biology data set. And it doesn't mean that an accountant wouldn't come up with better features on the finance data set. 
So just because there are these mathematical techniques that allow you to take advantage of geometry, these are not necessarily better than using expert knowledge. Now I want to point out that we've already taken advantage of this mathematical approach in this section. You and I probably don't know too much about breast cancer or airfoils, and yet we were able to build some pretty accurate models for those datasets. How is this possible? Well, it's because models like deep neural networks do automatic feature extraction when they are learning. Now, of course, you're going to learn a lot more about this in the future, so don't worry exactly how this works right now. But this highlights one important point, which is that we can actually combine these two methods, and that allows us to do even more powerful things. So you can use your expert domain knowledge to come up with useful feature vectors, and you present this to your machine learning model as X. But on the other hand, your machine learning model can take those features and come up with yet more powerful features that help to improve its modeling capabilities. It's worth noting though that in deep learning, we usually take the approach where we don't do any feature engineering at all and just let the neural network do all the work. So for example, if you're trying to classify digits from the MNIST dataset, you wouldn't convert your image into a feature vector. You would just pass your image into the model directly. So whether you take the hybrid approach or not is dependent both on what kind of data set you have and what kind of model you're using.